let's talk about GPS running watches. More specifically, how do they work? Give me 15 minutes and I promise to make you smarter. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Running Otaku. I am the Running Otaku and today we're going to talk about GPS running watches. Now, I'm not going to do a review of any specific watch this episode. That's going to happen a little bit later in the week. For today, I want to talk about the technology and how these watches actually work so you can have a little bit of an appreciation for the technology and understand some of the things that can throw your accuracy off. And with that, let's get right into it. I'm going to be using my trusty iPad today. Okay, so here is the Earth and I am somewhere on the Earth. The question is, how does the watch know where I am? Well, let's see here. Okay, I'm still there. Let's imagine that outside of the Earth there is a GPS satellite and here's one here. Now, here's what happens. The satellite sends a signal down to the Earth and that signal has the exact time because there's an atomic clock on the satellite uh, and its position. And so the watch can see the time stamp from when the signal actually left the satellite and compare it to when the watch actually receives it and can figure out how long it took. So for example, it might take something like 70 milliseconds, which is, you know, seven hundredths of a second. Now, it turns out that the speed at which that signal is sent from the satellite to us is the speed of light which is pretty darn fast, right? Just about 300 million meters per second. That's faster than Elliot Kipchoge. Anyways, so we know that distance equals uh, time times speed. Um, and one other thing we need to remember, this guy, uh, Einstein. So if you remember the theory of relativity, or even if you don't remember, it doesn't really matter. Anyways, time is relative. So it's actually ticking a little bit slower on the satellite that's moving very fast relative to us. So the GPS satellites actually can take this small difference into account. So they honor Einstein and the time uh, is relative to us on the Earth. At any rate, that's a little bit too much detail for you. But the distance then is the 70 milliseconds times that speed of light and in this case for instance it turns out to be just under 21,000 kilometers and so that's how the satellite can and the watch can figure out exactly how far apart they are from each other now once uh, we have that then the watch knows that it's you know that 20,985 kilometers away from the satellite but it doesn't know exactly where uh, it is it could be up here it could be down there um, and so you can see this circle here. So the watch could be anywhere on this orange circle. I suppose to be a little bit more accurate, it, it's actually a three-dimensional space. It could be a sphere, um, but I'm not very good at drawing spheres in PowerPoint. So we're just going to look at this kind of from a pancake view. Um, and so the watch knows that it can be anywhere on this uh, radius, excuse me, on this circumference, uh, this yellow line. But now let's suppose we had a second satellite somewhere in space that did the exact same thing, this orange one. Now your watch is starting to get a little bit of a better idea of where it is relative to the satellites. In essence, it could be here at this first intersection or here at the second intersection, so somewhere there. But now let's say there's a third satellite. Okay, and if we go through this exercise again, here's one intersection, a second one, a third one. Uh, and now it's starting to get a much better idea. Let's go one step further. Okay, if there's a fourth satellite, now the uh, watch pretty much knows where it is because that's where all of these kind of spheres are intersecting. And it turns out that your watch will need four satellites to really determine with any significant accuracy exactly where it is. And in this case, it's at this dot right here. So that's how the watch figures out where it is on the Earth. Now, let's talk about the different kind of satellite systems that are out there. The first of which uh, we all know, it's called GPS. More specifically, the system is called Navstar. Uh, GPS, we kind of use it as a generic term, but it actually refers to just the American constellation of satellites. Um, and they are orbiting the Earth at, uh, looks like, 20,180 kilometers above the surface. Um, and they are orbiting the Earth um, and there are six orbital planes. So you're probably asking now, what the heck is an orbital plane? I've got the answer. 
So here's the Earth again. Now, here are four satellites that are circling the Earth. And you can see they're all circling in the same track. So they're all in the same plane. So this would be considered one plane. A two-plane system, you can see here. Here's the third plane, and on and on. So this GPS system, uh, the American uh, constellation, is operating in six planes uh, around the Earth. At any rate, the satellite takes 11 hours and 56 minutes to make one full revolution. So that means uh, it, it makes two revolutions just in just less than a day, so eight minutes less than the full 24 hours. So that means that with the GPS satellites, if you left your door on Monday to go for a run at 8 a.m., and then on Tuesday you left your door eight minutes earlier at 7.52 a.m., the satellites would be in the exact same orientation they were the day before. Pretty cool, huh? Anyways, there are 32 uh, satellites in the GPS constellation, and the accuracy is about five meters, uh, moving down towards closer to one meter as they improve the technology. Um, and this is just for civilian use. For government and military use, they're actually within kind of centimeters now, which means that if they wanted to, they could probably drop a cruise missile right through your chimney. But let's not talk about that. The next, uh, what do I call it? The next constellation, uh, GLONASS, you may have heard about, is actually Russian. Um, and it operates much like GPS does. Um, but instead of six planes, there are three. Um, right now there are 26 uh, GLONASS satellites and the accuracy you can see is about 7 meters or so. Next up is Galileo. Uh, this is a relatively new constellation from the European Union. It's uh, traveling a little bit higher here in orbit. Um, and so the period of revolution is a little bit slower because it's got further to go. Um, and it's got, I believe at the time of this recording, uh, there's 26 satellites but they're ramping up quickly to 30 and you can see the accuracy here. So these are the three most common constellations um, and uh, a lot of watches support these three but they're not the only three there's a few others which I wanted to talk about. So the next of which is IRNSS which is an Indian constellation um, and you can see here there's a little bit of a different these satellites aren't moving around the earth they're orbiting with the Earth, so they're staying what's called in geosynchronous orbit, so at the same position relative to the globe. Um, and so they're focused on greater India uh, and the countries around it. Um, and you can see there are um, seven satellites, and they'll be increasing that to 11. Next up is Beidou. Um, I don't speak any Mandarin. I'm sure my pronunciation was way off. But this is a Chinese constellation similar to the Indian one, uh, also in geosynchronous orbit, so they're not spinning around the Earth. Uh, and so, um, let's see, there are 15 of these satellites, um, and they will be adding many more over the years to come. It looks like they have a schedule for 35. And right now, it's just focused on greater China uh, and Southeast Asia. But I believe that as they increase to 35, then they will have global coverage um, and it will be much closer to Navstar um, and GLONASS and Galileo. And then finally QZSS, which is the Japanese uh, constellation. There's four satellites focused on Japan, uh, the Japan Sea, and some of the countries around it as well. And you can see the accuracy here. Okay, so that's how the satellites work and the different constellations now let's talk about what makes your watch inaccurate. The first of which is a phenomenon called multipath. So let's see, here I am right down here and I am running down uh, the streets of downtown Portland. Um, so let's imagine there is a satellite up above and it's beaming its signal directly to me and it's fine, the buildings aren't blocking it, so that's okay. And then there's a second satellite doing the same, so pretty good. As I mentioned, we need four, so the first two are good. But then let's look what happens at this third satellite. You see it's blocked here because I'm right alongside this building. So what's happening is the path is going off of this building, bouncing off and hitting me. And this bounce um, causes some confusion because 
the watch thinks that it, it's a direct line of sight from the satellite, um, but it's not. There was this bounce here, which adds a little bit of distance to the path, which is just enough to throw the uh, watch off a little bit. Um, and so this multi-path is one of the causes of error. Um, so if you're running in the canyons, the concrete canyons of downtown, or if you're on a trail in this steep kind of canyon, the same phenomenon exists. Now, there's also a, a situation in multi-path where the signal bounces off the ground uh, and back up to the watch. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But anyways, multi-path is one of the most common occurrences of uh, error. Next are atmospheric conditions. So the first layer um, is the troposphere. <laughs> and a word I just learned researching this like two days ago, the tropopause, no idea what that is, and the stratosphere. Anyways, these three layers combine to make up the first 50 kilometers of altitude above the surface of the Earth. And then from 50 to 200 kilometers above is the ionosphere, which I just think is a cool word. Um, and if you recall, the satellites are way beyond this. They are like 20,000 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So imagine we've got a couple of satellites here that are going to be beaming their signal to me. Uh, they're going at a certain speed when they, the, the signal's at a certain speed when it hits the ionosphere. And then there's some density, some stuff in there that could affect the signal a little bit. Um, and then when it hits the troposphere, uh, the same thing happens again until it finally gets to me. So depending on the conditions of the troposphere and the ionosphere, it could have a marginal impact on the signal as it hits the watch. A third common cause of error is what's known as receiver noise, or in this case, body position. So let's imagine we've got a satellite up here and it's hitting my watch directly, so no problem there. The second satellite, no problem there. The third one, no problem. See a pattern? But the fourth one, it actually, my body is blocking the signal to the watch um, and that's causing some error. So it turns out when you're running and swinging your arm, it's actually not very good for reception. If the watches wanted to be a little bit more precise, I suppose they would put a receiver on your head, <laughs> but that would just be silly. So we're not gonna talk about that. But anyways, whether it's your body or a thick canopy of tree cover above you, that can actually impact the signal and reduce accuracy. So exactly how much? Well, I wanted to look at these kind of conditions just to give you a relative idea of approximately how much it can throw off the watch. So the multipath, for instance, can throw off the watch by 0.6 meters in the ionospheric condition, 0.4, etc., all the way down. So not a huge uh, difference, but enough to be significant. Now, the watchmakers can actually mitigate these errors to a certain extent based on how well they design the antenna uh, and the algorithms and the mathematics they use in order to compute uh, from the data that's coming in. Now, the antenna design is pretty interesting and I think it, we can get really into the weeds here, but just to give you one example, I talked about that multi-path situation where the signal's bouncing off the ground into the watch. So it turns out the watchmakers actually can put, I think it's called a collar or something essentially on the antenna, which can see the angle of incidence that that signal is hitting the watch. And if it's coming from below the watch, it can actually essentially negate or disregard that signal so it doesn't suffer from multipath in that instance. So it's pretty cool. So that's just one example of how antenna design can actually improve performance. And then the algorithms, I don't know what kind of black magic they're using there, but I think there are some things that they can do to continually tweak it. And so that's why when you get a firmware update uh, to your watch, you might start noticing over time better improvement in accuracy. Okay, so finally, let's talk about some of the popular watches out there and what kind of systems they're connected to. So the first of which are just released uh, Forerunner series from Garmin, the 945 and the 245 and the 45. Um, it's using a brand new chip, well, at least new to Garmin, uh, Forerunner series uh, from Sony. And that chip uh, can read the Navstar GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo. And that's why, you know, they always ask you, you know, which ones do you want to connect to? It could connect to all three. The Polar Vantage V and M, I believe, are also using that exact same chip, um, and they connect to GPS and GLONASS. I think in the literature it says that it does not, or it doesn't make mention of Galileo, uh, which is something that, from what I understand, they can fix with the 
uh, software update, so maybe they already have or plan to do so. But theoretically, it should be able to handle that constellation of satellites as well. And the Sunto 9 also, from what I understand, uses that same Sony chip. So it should be in the exact same situation as the other two. Um, now, in their literature, they say they connect to QZSS, which is the Japanese constellation for if you're in Japan. Um, so if that's true, then I suppose that the Garmin uh, and the Polar uh, watches should be able to connect to QZSS as well. However, when I reviewed the Japanese version of their literature, I didn't see any mention of QZSS. So I don't know if they have any plans to do so or not. And then finally, Apple Watch 4 connects to these four constellations you see here. So that was a pretty long lecture, but some of you may be asking, okay, that's all fine and good, but I really only had <laughs> one question, and that is, do I set my watch to GPS, GPS plus GLONASS, or GPS plus Galileo? Uh, that's a good question, and I wish I really had a good answer for you. Um, but like all tough questions, the answer is, it depends. What does it depend upon? Well, basically it's a trade-off between battery life and accuracy. Uh, so in doing my research, it sounds like the more constellations to which you connect to, so if you're connecting to GPS uh, and GLONASS, or GPS and GLONASS and Galileo, anyways, the more constellations you connect to, the bigger the hit it, there is on the battery. And I'm not sure if that's because of the added computational power necessary, or probably more likely something uh, that has to do with the antenna. But evidently, the more you connect to, the more your battery drains. And I don't know if it's a 10% hit, or a 30% hit, or a 0.1% hit, but evidently it does affect battery life. Then on the other side is accuracy. So theoretically, the more constellations to which you connect, the better the accuracy should be. Right? It's like solving a bunch of simultaneous equations. You know, the more equations you have given the same number of variables, uh, the answer should be better defined. But I've also read uh, anecdotally in some literature that some people think that if you connect to multiple systems, the accuracy could be actually decreased. To me, that doesn't make any sense. So maybe if one of you knows uh, why this might be the case, I would love to hear in the comments below. Let me know. But anyways, this is essentially the trade-off here. Um, and I don't really know why the watchmakers allow you to choose between GPS plus GLONASS or GPS or GPS plus Galileo. Because frankly, none of us have enough information in order to make an intelligent decision. And at that point, that's a, actually a design flaw from the product managers. They shouldn't leave it to us to make a decision <laughs> if we don't have enough basis of information to be able, well, if we don't have enough information to make that judgment. Okay, so there you go, that's it for today. I hope I made you, you know, a little bit smarter and maybe you'll be the life of the party at your next group run, who knows? Anyways, if you like what you saw, please go ahead and click the like button. If you really like what you saw, then go ahead and click subscribe. And while you're at it, hit the little bell right next to it. That way you'll be instantly notified every time I upload a new video, which will be really helpful because in a few days, I will come out with my GPS review of the Garmin Forerunner 245. So once again, thank you for watching and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.